Um, so good afternoon, HCR members. Uh, welcome to another COVID-19 virtual event series. Today we are joined uh, by Brad Inman, founder of Inman News, and of course our president and CEO, Bob Hale. Um, they're going to have a discussion about COVID and its impacts on real estate, on the world, on businesses. Uh, so they have a lot to discuss. So I will stop talking and hand the floor over to them in just a second. But I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions uh, in the chat. Uh, just note that when you are typing something into the chat, you have an option to send it to just the panelists. But you also have the option to send it to panelists and all attendees. So if you think your question uh, might be answered by other attendees or any HAR staff that are also watching um, this session, I would, I would send your question to uh, att all attendees. All right, so Brad, Bob, take the floor. Thanks, Christine. Uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to have the most uh, well-known person in real estate uh, share with our members today. And this is going to be a conversation. This is not a presentation with PowerPoints and all that. It's just two good friends talking. First, I want to say welcome home, Brad, to HAR. You have been a speaker at our Engage Conference. You've been a participant at our Strategic Leadership Conferences. Over the years, you've become great friends with our officers and our staff. You're part of the HAR family. So welcome home. We love you. We're so proud that... Uh, you spent a little time with us today. Hey, now, Bob, it's an honor you uh, you keep asking me back. Yeah. Uh, I really, truly appreciate it. And uh, I feel like I'm speaking to certainly one of the premier leaders in the industry. And particularly, I've noticed your leadership during the, uh, the uh, you know, the whole mess we've been in. So yeah. uh, hail to you and, and all of HAR and the membership. And, you know, it's a great group, big part of the Inman family. So how are you doing? You've been, you've been alone now for about six weeks and what have you been up to? Well, you're right. Um, my lovely wife, Yaz, who you know, Bob, has uh, had to go out east uh, to help right. her mother get to Morocco. And she, uh, and I decided when she, after this kind of exploded that we should probably stay apart for our own safety. Uh, and she came back yesterday, but I wasn't really alone, Bob. Uh, one day, about two weeks ago, I looked out my front window and I saw a group of uh, unicorns grazing in the front yard. And then after about a, a week, I started waving and they're nodding. And then um, five days ago, I started talking to them and I learned a lot. Unicorns can um, bounce around the world and they also are immune to viruses. And yesterday, before I picked up Yaz at LAX, um, one of the unicorns said, Bradley, this is the last time we're gonna be able to see you and talk to you. And I got shivers. I said, really? I was sad. And they go, yes, because we know Yaz is coming home today and we need to move on to the next person who's alone during the coronavirus. And now, what's the point of all that, Bob? The point is all of us, I think, have suffered from semi-breakdowns, crazy thoughts, yeah. a little bit of anger. We've had panic attacks. We felt lonely, even people that are in a, in a house full of people. And we've uh, wanted to you know, slay our spouses. We've wanted to lock our children in the closet. And you know what this is called? It's called being human. Yeah. And what I love about this is, you know, there's people in the coaching and other business that talk about training people to be authentic. You know what authentic is? Authentic is just being who you are at any given time. You don't need to be trained to be who you are. And what I do like is some of the big shots, particularly, you know, bringing down their, their, their armor and being a little more regular, a little less corporate speak. But here's a great example of humanness that people in this audience, I think, will be able to relate to. Over the course of about the last three or four weeks, every once in a while, there's a brown bag left on my front uh, porch. And I go out and I go, oh, is it a bomb? What's in there? And I open it and there's something in there, one or two items that I really, really like. And it's, I thought, this is someone that knows me. In fact, last night when Yas and I came back from LAX, was a bag full of cooked, perfectly cooked 
uh, barbecue ribs, and we were starved. Two weeks ago, it was a leg of lamb. Three weeks ago, it was a whole chicken. And now, who was that? Did it come from Zoom? No. Did it come from DoorDash? No. Did it come from Realtor.com? No. Did it come from Zillow? No. Did it come from Remax Realogy or KW Headquarters? No. Guess who it came from? My no. local realtor. No business card, no follow-up facts, no expectation, just sincere empathy knowing that I was home alone. And that's, we've had crazy human emotions. Why wouldn't someone be emotional now? But we've also had this incredible outpouring of empathy and by the real estate industry, it's, it's friggin' mind blowing. And you know, I really wanna, I don't wanna preach here, but I will, now more than ever. The top of the real estate pyramid needs to be selfless and sacrifice everything to support the hardworking realtor. The person that gets no commission, gets no big corporate salary, doesn't get maternity leave, doesn't get paternity leave, doesn't get health insurance. Because I worry this spring and summer is gonna be hell days for these people. So now it's time to support them unequivocally, passionately, and give them everything we can. Because Inman News wouldn't exist, HAR wouldn't exist, Zilla wouldn't exist, Realogy wouldn't exist, KW wouldn't exist. None of them exist because of the people at the top. They exist for the hardworking realtor that pays dues, pays subscriptions, pays a percent of commission. So I think the whole industry should make the month of May absolute unequivocal sacrifice and commitment to the everyday agent. What do you think, Bob? Totally on board. Totally Let's start a proclamation. Yeah. We just did a presentation this morning to a brokerage about what HAR is doing along these lines. And I feel like we're doing everything we humanly can. And they were very, very pleased. But I'm with you 100%. So but we got to reach higher, Bob, and we got to dig deeper. We've got to do even more now because it's going to be tough for these cats this summer. Yeah. I know you've, over the last few weeks, you've called me and said, hey, what are you doing at 4 o'clock? Let's do a quick Zoom, and you'll get Greg Robertson or David Sharon or Alex Brillo, and we just visit. And so that's something we wouldn't have done before. We'd, we'd have never got together with people around the country and just, you know, like we're sitting around in the living room and visit. How do you, how do you, you know, what do you well, think? I stopped doing that, Bob, because I decided about two weeks ago that I was drinking too much. And I, I, I always say I love to drink and I love not to drink. And I'm liking now not drinking because it was kind of taking me into a zone. I didn't want to be, you know, not getting drunk, but just, you know, you got to stay healthy during this. You got to keep your, your, your stuff together and you got to stay focused and clear headed and, you know, I'm I'm revving up for May being Realtor Month, and I, I just got to have every every element of the force to help do that. Yeah, good, good. I know you're a a sentimental guy, and uh, you reflect a lot on your past. I mean, you talk a lot about it. <clears throat> You've had weeks now to <clears throat> to reflect on lots of things that happened during your life. Kind of what thoughts have you had? Well, you know, um, I don't know about all you, but this is an incredible moment of reflection. And once you start reflecting and have time to do it, yeah. you know, you think about how rushed we are pre-corona. Plane rides, hotels, going here, going there, and, and even people that don't travel in their car, picking up their kids, going here, talking to the teachers. Talk, I mean, it's, it's crazy making. We never have moments to reflect. And it's just like, we never gave the planet a break. You know, yesterday was Earth Day and uh, we're giving the planet a break. And I think this coronavirus is giving each and every one of us a break, a needed break from that mm, buzz, buzz, buzz. And so what happens when you reflect? For me, memories from the past come back. Yaz and I went through being apart, just shared so many pictures of the times we were together, so many fun times. But a lot of things would just hit me out of the blue, Bob. Um, I'm at the sink washing dishes, which I love to do. And I know that sounds weird, but I, I've always liked washing dishes. And I look out the window and uh, I was out of dishwashing soap. 
and it was down to about here. And so I just instinctively filled it with water instead of going to the closet. And why is that? Because I probably for the first time in my life, and I don't want to overstate, that, I've been in my younger years, I had $20 in the checking account. So I was, I'm not always had everything I wanted, but I filled it with water. And I went, where'd that come from? And you know what I understood for a moment? Scarcity. Because the last time I went into Walmart online, I couldn't find dishwashing soap. So I, for the first time in my life that I could remember, my adult life, I experienced scarcity. That then made me remember the time my mother made hamburgers for the neighbor boys, including the new big shot in the neighborhood, David Lusk. And they all came to my house and I wanted everything to be right. You know, you don't want your parents to do something stupid. And David grabbed the ketchup bottle, poured it on his hamburger and it ran all over the burger. And the reason I ran all the burger is my mom put water in everything. And why was that? Because she was a dep depression girl. She was a family of 11. They had seven crop failures in a row. And her parents dropped her off in Canada for five years because they couldn't afford her. And she knew scarcity. And she was an optimistic person, but she knew scarcity. So it just stayed with her through life. And she couldn't, why would you not mix water with the ketchup? So... I'm having those experiences that are really fantastic. Another one, I cleaned out the garage like we all do, you know, and I found a letter from Peter Berger. And that letter was from back in the day when I got out of college. Peter Berger was my best friend in college. He went to New York. I went West. And it was a letter with just three letters. And you know what it was? A chess move. Because back in the day, and I'd forgotten this for 40 years, Peter and I played chess by mail. We had a board in his house, in my apartment. We mailed our moves back and forth, and it took six months to play chess. So all, what, now what's that story about? Well, that story is about, I mean, the first one is scarcity. Let's stop consuming so much, Bob. It's hurting the planet. It makes us psycho. And let's also slow down and play chess by mail. Maybe not that extreme, but these stories that you reflect on all have lessons, and that Honestly, I am just overwhelmed by the number of things that I forgot even happened. Could you share, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> in, in thinking about getting together today, I thought back too about things that you've told me or I've experienced <clears throat> with you. Tell, can you tell us about your road trip with Yaz? I, oh, I it was a pretty mighty, a yeah. Very fun story. Yeah, Yaz, I think, I think newlyweds are doing this now where they're isolated. They have to test out the, the marriage. Yaz and I met and Yaz said, let's take a road trip so we can test whether this is the real deal. <laughs> and uh, so we were going to go 30 days and we'd taken weekend road trips. We know we kind of dress rehearsed for this thing. And we were going to go for 30 days and we went for nine months and wound up in Southern California and bought a house. Uh, Yaz is very tall. We had a beast of a, call, a car that we bought. She kind of customized it. It looked kind of like a druggy, you know, car. And, uh, you know, we sailed across the United States and, um, you know, it was really a, a really a beautiful time. We, uh, she has these one favorite song. I think we listened to 3000 times, but, uh, we sang, we had a really good time and it, it was really quite beautiful. And, uh, you know, I think that's what is happening to a lot of people. Now they're getting to know their spouse. My, my daughter says, you know, we're getting to know the kids better than we knew. Them. So <laughs> I, I think all that so about, <clears throat> when you would pull up to a small town like the cafe. Yeah, we would dress up. I pretended I was the driver and Yaz would be all dressed up and go into a coffee shop with her gloves and order a coffee and I'd wait outside and uh, you have to see Yaz to appreciate this. Um, and uh, then she would come into the car and everyone in town, you know, little village would be looking at us take off and um, Yaz said to me once, do you think the people in that small town will remember that? And I said, Yes, they're going to remember for 20 years. Who was that woman? You know, <laughs> I remember back uh, in Sonoma at your house, and you had a small group of CEOs up there before you were in my conference, <clears throat> and uh, you dig, dug a big pit. And was it lamb? Is that what you cooked or pig? Yeah, we cooked a uh, lamb. My friend Mitch Kapoor yeah. is from Croatia, and he uh, roasted a lamb. Um, yeah, it was that was those are good old days, man. 
but think about how few people were involved. Now you have thousands at your conferences. I mean, yeah, we started out, you know, just you always start out with every business, the first customer. That's why people put a dollar bill over the bar. You know, yeah. they, they never forget that first customer. You know, and when we launched in Manus in 1996, we just had a handful. Interestingly, buyers agents, because they tend to be nerdy and Remax, because they tended back in the day to be more professional. Yeah. And, you know, it grew from there. And um, like you, Bob, I think it was really simple. We stuck to our values of independent news. We never compromised ourselves. And we did what we did with integrity. And if we made a mistake, we tried to correct it. And we made a lot of mistakes. You know, I, you know me, Bob, I pissed off the big shots for a long time. <laughs> you remember walking down the hall in the, in the Palace Hotel and Susie stopping you? And what did she say? Well, I took, and I still do, I take what I produce and create very, very seriously. It's like preparing for this. I take this really seriously. This is... This is my job, and it's more than a job. It's what I'm passionate about. And I used to be so damn serious. And I think I was serious my whole life till I met Yaz. And she taught me to life. She taught me how to enjoy life. She once said to me, Brad, take the world really seriously. It's not, you know, you got to take the world seriously, but stop taking yourself so seriously. You know, lighten up. But Susie said to me when I had one, this big fat frown on, picking up little pieces of paper and the carpeting floor as I walked down the hall. <laughs> she goes, Brad, you got to smile because everyone looks to you, you know, as, as the, as the producer of this event. And if you're not smiling, they think something's wrong. <laughs> I never forgot that. It was good advice. And, and, and I think about over the years of going to your conferences and, and I have a lot of friends that get excited about hunting season to go hunt deer or go hunt birds. And I get excited about, hunting at Inman Connect. Oh. There you hunt people. Yeah, I have met so many gun, though, Bob. I've met so many industry leaders that you have introduced me to that we've become friends. And That's whether they're they're leaders at a at a franchise or a large broker or a portal, they all how about an every how about an everyday working agent, Bob? Forget all yeah. those guys. The, the but, everyday well, working agents that come to Connect. Absolutely. But all these people impact our members. Yeah, it's great. And, and, and so Inman is, the, is the, the place where everybody can get together and meet people you would never meet and become friends for life. I mean, look at Sherry Chris. How often have we gotten with her? It's, 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 it's really fun to think back about all the people we've met and, and still have relationships with. Babe, uh, Bob, I called you babe. Can you believe it? Uh, Bob, we got a comment here. Some really good stuff. One people are asking about Connect. Yes, we're having Connect this summer, June 2nd through June 4th. It's called Connect Now. It will be entirely digital. A brand new, interesting experience um, with everyday working agents on panels, um, CEOs, all the big shots, um, innovators. We'll have a lot of interactivity. Um, you can, I think you're all members, uh, in HAR, if you've signed up to be a select member, it's very simple. Bob delivers it to you for free. Then you can, uh, pay only 50 bucks. And by the way, this is, um, like 90% off what you pay to come to a live right. connect. And why is that? You don't have to pay 500 for a hotel room. You don't have to pay 500 for an airplane. You don't have to have meals. You don't have to pay 700 to come to Connect. So instead of being somewhere between 1500 and $2,000, it's 50 bucks. And you know, you all have been coming to us for Connect for 25 years. This time, we're coming to you. Yeah. And I always say, people say, well, what? give me the details. I say, June 2nd to June 4th. And they say, where is it? And I say, in your living room. So move some chairs around, have some coffee, make sure you some half, some half and half for me. But you've been coming to me for a long time. Now we're coming to you. That's now, will it be uh, like a real event? No, it'll be a better experience. Uh, it'll be mind blowing. Just, just the uh, exhibit hall and what you can interact with and get and information, it's gonna be amazing. But I don't wanna blow my horn. Let's talk about some more stuff. Now, aren't you gonna ask me about technology, Bob, please? Latasha actually uh, commented, we have no excuse not to go. And we do have some questions coming in from members. Uh, do you right. want to?
you want to look at those, Bob, or do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. Okay, uh, Belinda was asking, um, will our industry continue to consolidate? Um, and she was also asking uh, what you think, which of our new habits prompted by COVID will continue or be permanent? Yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't know, there's two theories on consolidation. Companies are going to get in trouble here, I hate to say, but those are probably the companies that maybe were already suffering margin compression, you know, brokerages, and, uh, you know, they were spending too much in office space, and now people have an alternative. Um, but I think some will get stronger, those particularly that have adopted technology pre-corona and during corona. But yeah, there will be consolidation. But then there's another thesis. You know, did you see the unemployment numbers today? They were another weekly disaster. And with this many people unemployed, what happens? People, Ryan Serhan said to me the other day, he said, Brad, I'm getting calls right and left. My friends who are unemployed, Wall Street, wherever, uh, how, do, how do I become a realtor like you, Ryan? And there's a new generation that came out of the 2010 uh, crisis that are really attractive to the outside. I want to be like Ryan. I want to be like, you know, these hip happening new agents. And so now the next generation is going to, so I think we could go both ways. We could be flooded with uh, new agents. And, um, you know, I think, uh, but the tech's going to be the decider here. Um, and this is what I'm really happy about. I used to say, uh, for 20 years, I said, technology, get it all, try it all. The half that doesn't work, no, nah, that's a sunk cost. But the half that does work will make you twice as competitor, competitive as your competitors. But I'm throwing that out now during coronavirus and into the future. We never had time to discern what technology worked and didn't. We were too busy. We would buy stuff based on the sales pitch, you know, the, the coolest guy in the exhibit hall or the best pitch in the phone or the fanciest website. And that's no way to buy products. Um, and I'll just tell you my own personal experience. I have a house, always way too much technology. And um, I found one day I turned on the rumba and the rumba was just making way too much noise, talking back to me when I tried to move it. And, you know, I've been a big fan of robots, but I, finally just said, you know, this is bullshit. I love a broom like I love washing dishes. And I grabbed the rumba and I threw it in the swimming pool. And it was such a fantastic feeling to toss that in the swimming pool. Now the pool guy the next morning wanted to know if he could have it. And I said, sure, if you can figure it out. And I gave him the plug. But the point is we now have the time to curate Think about, you know, a lot of these technologies are business partnerships that we don't know about. That people are selling us and we should know about that. We should try and test things. We should buy the technology. So now's the time, and particularly because the wallet size of most realtors won't be thick enough to support this stuff. And so now more than ever, I think we have the time to curate and think about and make sure that we're buying the technology that really, really works. And the good news is things like, uh, you know, transactions without paper and no notary and virtual showings and all the stuff that makes life easier for the consumer and for the agent are gonna work. But some of these other things, like think about it. One thing we've learned during coronavirus is inane marketing BS marketing, like let me give you an example. Drip marketing. That sounds like torture during the Bush administration. Oh, I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> this is a Texas audience. We all love George. I'm sorry, George. But my point is, it sounds like torture drip marketing. I think we'll rethink marketing, maybe service instead of sales in our marketing. You know, maybe things that really benefit the consumer because now we're better connected to each other. Uh, and I'm always hopeful and optimistic, but I, I think we've learned a lot during this. By the way, after I, well, after I said this in another uh, podcast or some three people sent me new rumbas. <laughs> I remember years ago at, at one of your conferences, you were talking about your realtor, you were out of town and you got an offer 
or you're making an offer. And she said, I'll fax you the contract. And you said, no, let's do DocuSign. And she said, what is DocuSign? And you said, when you figure it out, call me back. Yeah, I said, I'm going to walk away from the transaction. You, yeah, you said, I'll just go get a different realtor if that's the problem. And so you were, you've always been sort of on the way out there pushing the more streamlined transaction, the more efficient transaction, the, the, the one that everybody kind of wants. And also the story, Bob, uh, just a, a different one. Um, yeah. My mom and dad were in Las Vegas at their tail end of their life and we had to move them. And it was one of the hardest things we did to move them from their home into um, assisted living. Oh, it was so difficult. And, um, and my dad was still like, okay, we got to sell the house. We got to sell the house. And he called my three brothers and he goes, let's have the real estate, real estate okay. expert of the family, Brad Inman, find a realtor. So, okay. Dad. So I go out and I decided, you know, I'd started home game, which we had just sold and I knew all those, little, all those characters. So I went online to find my realtor and I think it was only like a day or two later. And dad said, how's that going? Brad? <laughs> Well, I'm getting there. I'm, you know, I'm interviewing. I'm doing the process, and he goes, Bradley, this market is crashing, and every day matters. It's like catching a falling knife. I want you to go back to the house, and on the refrigerator is a magnet for the realtor that sells every single home in our neighborhood in Summerlin, in, in Nevada, and I want you to call that guy and tell him you want to list the house. And we sold it all cash in 30 days. And so the lesson in that is. Technology's great, but you know, a broom works better than a rumba. And you know, sometimes a, a refrigerator magnet works just as good as Zillow Premier Agent. So we got to kind of, as we get over ourselves during this, we all have to get over our kind of, and this is Brad Inman saying this, the guy that's been trying to peddle the concept of technology. But I just think now's a balancing, you know, that we could kind of put things in perspective. If I can, um, I saw a comment that's now come in twice, or kind of a question, kind of a comment. Uh, Robin Mick said, brick and mortar going forward seem less significant with all the offices that have been set up at home. And um, Roz reminded, uh, reminded me that HAR, uh, we did a survey of 3,700 members uh, responded to, and they said post COVID about 40% of them intend to work more from home. So how do you... Uh -huh going to impact brokers in their office space well think about it you all it, it's there are situations when you have to be across from somebody like i have a brand new grandson that's been alive two and a half weeks and i have not seen uh i don't want to spend my lifetime as a grandfather with little austin on a zoom call you hear me like let's just go down to the basics our family um it's really essential that we recognize where and when that's important but let's go to the other extreme do we ever need to negotiate a contract again live no do we ever need to do a closing live no all business contracts do we ever need to be present no <coughs> all of this stuff can be done more efficiently so unfortunately it's going to really affect business travel business people just don't need to you know, go to all these stupid, silly meetings. And that includes realtors not even getting on airplanes. But on that note, it's interesting. I just added up this morning, the market cap, United America, Delta, JetBlue, Southwest, all of the big airlines. The big airlines market cap is less than Zoom. And you just let that thought and think about it if you, later in the day, what that means. But what that means, is I think after this, <clears throat> business travel, the airline industry, the hotel industry is probably permanently changed because we just don't need it. And therefore, we don't need all these conference rooms and all these meetings rooms to have those contract negotiations and closings. And it's just useless. And um, that's not great news for commercial real estate as we know it. But I've also found commercial real estate people are pretty smart. Mario will figure it out. Um, they'll figure out how to turn you know, this thing into opportunity. We're already seeing it in retail space. But I think those are fundamental changes. And I think your stat is overwhelming. I think, I think probably half the commercial office space as we knew, know it 
is going to have to be adapted and readapted into different uses than we've known in the past. We're developing, or Taki and his department are developing a uh, virtual uh, open house product. And I was talking to uh, Dolly Lenz the other day in New York and telling her about it. And she said she predicts very few in-person open houses going forward because she said people don't want 30 people, strangers walking through their house. And the buildings there, I mean, they're mainly high rises. The buildings don't want 30 strangers walking through the building. So there may be some changes that, that will stick, that will continue on. Oh, a lot of them, I think, Bob. Yeah, I really do. Ted Jones, who's the uh, chief economist <clears throat> for Stuart Title, was saying their day, he gave a PowerPoint presentation to over 1,100 realtors in, uh, in Florida sitting in his office without having to get on an airplane, check it into a hotel. He said, I would have never, if I'd have gone there, never spoken to 1,100 because no one's going to buy a room that day. So I mean, we are seeing some very positive uh, things come out of it. We'll continue. Yeah, absolutely. Somebody was asking, do you know any of the speakers at your uh, conference yet? Yeah, it's all on Connect now. You go and we got dozens of them and more coming every day. <clears throat> we got some really great people. A couple of questions about um, Houston specifically and uh, what you think the impact's going to be in regards to um, the oil industry and COVID-19. Yeah, you know, the best guide is history, and I think we know from history what happens to Houston. I think you're more diversified maybe than the early 80s. Um, you know, that was a, for people that have been around a while, that was a little bit of a bloodbath in Houston in the early 80s. And so I think the dog days for the whole industry around the country, uh, it, it, I, I can't sit here and just spin some tale to you all. It's not what I am or who I am. Uh, it's going to be tough the spring and the summer. And, you know, you're still not as dependent on oil, but you are um, in a way. So I think you'll suffer just like the Bay Area is going to suffer because of tech, because Los Angeles, because of Hollywood, New York, because of the financial sector, Florida, because of tourism. Um, it, it just, you know, good and bad. This is a great leveler. You know, this is um, we are all kind of equal. We're all in this together. When someone feels, you know, oh my God, I can't stand this. I'm isolated. Well, so is your neighbor, you know, so is someone in Iran and so is someone in India and so is someone in Texas. So <clears throat> it is a great leveler, I think, of, of, of what this is about. I have a good friend, Pat Stone, who's, he's a capitalist and he's successful. And he and I view the world the same about capitalism and entrepreneurship, but he also, been reading a lot now I've been reading a lot about that great decade in the 50s that we just never thought we could replicate and the 50s was the pre-financialization of the the global economy before Wall Street and all the shenanigans and debt and fees and you know just and started in the Reagan area but was <clears throat> continued during the Clinton area continued during the Bush era continued during Obama <clears throat> where Wall Street used to kind of take a back seat and capitalize companies, the, the size of the market wasn't that great, the risk wasn't that great. And then suddenly it became something different. A time when, you know, CEOs, companies, my dad is an owner of his small company, he made three or four times what his best salesperson made. Uh, it was the, it was the democracy, it was the decade of equality, not racial, and we shouldn't dismiss that because that was wrong and bad, but there was more, a little more economic equality where the middle class wasn't that far away from the super rich. And Pat contends that the financialization of our global economy contributed to the situation where you have the super rich and the poor and not a significant middle. And we own all the real estate industry, they're in that middle. And if you look at it, it explains why Trump was elected. It explains why people wanted Bernie Sanders. Because the working class people of this country on both sides of the political fence had enough of this financialization. And they wanted, they wanted things to be corrected. 
And that can be pointed in the wrong direction, that rage, we all know that. But I think it's pretty evident, and maybe the coronavirus, and we're like coming down from these lofty sort of dichotomies that we can start thinking about really, really meaningful ways. I mean, look, <laughs> there's a great economist, John Maynard Keynes, who the liberals always loved, love, love, love. And what was he about? He was about infusing capital and to build and to help people. And guess who's writing checks and fast as furious as they can? Republicans. So there is a weird consensus around investing in our schools so you can provide free education, not mounds of debt. It used to be you got a free college education in the United States in the 50s. You could get a VA loan if you got out of the service. I mean, there's so many elements to that decade of equality post-World War II. Uh, and we're coming out of a World War II here when we're all done with this. And uh, I think this is our chance to, to really begin to do the right thing. Get away from the idea of politicians and get into policy again, like good public policy. Um, like our governor in California, what's he investing in right now? Cleaning up the, the, the freeways because no one's on them. Um, that's the kind of stuff we need to do. We need to fix our infrastructure. We need to put emphasis on education and we need to be more mindful of the gaps between the rich and the poor and create, you know, inequality. That's the strength of our country, which we lost, which I think contributed to the political divides that separate us. And like it does in every part of the world every time. Terrorism was rooted in economic inequality. You know, poor young men felt disenfranchised and they, you know, they went on YouTube and decided to subscribe to radical, you know, radical terrorism. And so we have to be mindful of that here. And I think this gives us an opportunity to do that. I'm very optimistic about that. You know, speaking of financial inequality, I read uh, Andrea's article today in Inman, who, who in my opinion is your, your best writer, and she talked about she's looking for a home in San Francisco. Yeah, great story. Her is four hundred to four hundred fifty thousand about. Right, so it makes it sound like we're not paying her enough. <laughs> and it, but it makes you realize how how lucky you are to live in Houston, Texas. Yeah, because that buys you a lot of home here. And she yeah. said there are only four homes in the MLS that met that criteria. So she got her realtor. It yeah, it's a great story. It's a good read. And the first one, she said she walked in. She thought she looked at it online. It looked pretty darn good. She went in and she said, well, the realtor must have used a wide angle uh, lens on the camera because the living room was tiny compared to the way it looked in the picture. So, and then she goes to the second one and it looks pretty good. And she's walking down the hall and out in the middle of the hall is the, is the uh, hot water heater. She's what? And then, so each one was for 450,000. They didn't seem very good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was a great story. Yeah, yeah. Your, reader, your readers should read it, Bob. Yeah, it's it a reader. very good, you know, excellent article, I thought. It really brought it home. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to take a, another question from our members, um, I'm seeing I'm seeing our audience slip. You know, as a as a runner of events my whole life, that's the signal what we call the wrap. And I've got a great wrap when Bob's ready for it. Okay, uh, really quick, I do want to ask this question from Jay. Um, which sector which sectors of our market do you think will most be affected by COVID, and how do you think it's going to affect price point in residential housing? You know, I I. I am not an economist. I don't predict the future. I think most of the people that do, I've covered economists for 25 years as a journalist and they're always wrong and they're now more wrong than ever. And I just, you know, I can predict the weather in Palm Springs this afternoon and maybe tomorrow morning, but beyond that, I can't. I can predict the economy today and maybe tomorrow morning, not the stock market. So I, I don't really, no, for sure. I think all you got to do is read the Wall Street Journal every day, which I've done my whole life. And you just read the business page and it's bloody. And you can see who's doing well. I mean, look at Amazon. Their stock's gone up, you know, what, 20% this year. Um, and some of the tech companies and look at oil. And it, it's all pretty right in your face if you take the time to read. My strongest recommendation, though, is stop listening to broadcast news. Really do. 
And if you want to understand the coronavirus, go to the data sources and read the infection and death rates and see how they're climbing and then stabilizing and declining state by state. If you want to understand economic, economics, don't listen to CNBC, please. If you want to understand public policy, don't listen to CNN or Fox. Really tune those out, gang. They're not the best way to stay informed. There's so many good publications, whether it's The Economist or The Wall Street Journal or The New York Times. I mean, you may don't agree with some of the Times, but they have great features about people. And, and there's many other really studious, futurist publications that I read. And I just, I would be informed by facts and information and don't be informed by experts. <laughs> by the way, medical experts, yes, but these <laughs> bullshit forecasters and they don't know anything. I, I know them. And um, what really to listen to is, is, is watch even level-headed media. Because I think that CNN, Fox over the last five, has made people nuts, crazy. You know, and then you had social media on top and they got us running in circles, banging our heads against not only the wall, but each other. And I don't like banging heads with people that are across the street I don't care if they disagree with me on this or that. I mean, it's stupid not to like people because we have these political stakes in the ground where nothing else matters. And you know what? They're all riled up. We're all riled up by people, media stars, which we used to not have in this country. A journalist used to be equal pay to um, a cop and a teacher. And now we have media stars living in the Hamptons hanging around with the very wealthy and the other politicians. And then they go on and blab, blab, blab at the top of their lungs and get us all riled up. You gotta just ignore them for a while and um, focus on each other and focus on informed information and focus on good journalism. There's a lot of good journalism out there, balanced like Andrea. She takes her time to get it right. She's not be blabbing about being stuck in her basement. She's not blab. She's telling a real story with real detail and real facts. She, you know, it. I'm preaching here. I really am sorry, but I really think, in fact, ten people just got off when they started hearing me. <laughs> Can I end with something more positive, Bob? Yeah, please. See. Are we close, Christina? Yeah. You're the producer. Yeah, no, we're good. I mean, and her show. I don't want to the numbers, but the comments are great. People are are. I we literally just got a comment that says, "I love Brad Edmund." So oh. <laughs> they are they are enjoying this. Jenny, I'm going <laughs> to give you a free Jenny. They don't know what Jenny, <laughs> it, Jenny Three Road. I'm going to give you a free pass to to connect now. Can we make sure that happens, Bob? <laughs> you just made fifty dollars. You stroke Brad Edmund, you get fifty bucks. Uh, <laughs> Good job, Jenny. <laughs> Okay, you ready, Bob? Yeah. Okay. Yesterday morning, I, you know, again, reflection, I remembered the great San Francisco journalist, Herb Cain, who used to love to write about the fog in the summer coming into the Golden Gate Bridge. And for you, those that don't know, the fog comes in every summer in San Francisco. That's why Mark Twain said the coldest winter ever spent was summer in San Francisco. And the fog comes in and it really affects daily life. But I always thought Herb Cain had said this, but I learned doing a research that Carl Sandburg wrote these few words, the famous poet. And it, his poem, very short, the fog comes in on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city on silent haunches and then moves on. I love to write. And when I read that, that inspired me to write what I'm going to read to you next. Almost every summer day, the fog comes through the Golden Gate in San Francisco and defines life in that beautiful city. It defines work, play, our mood, and daily decisions. Then in the fall, its season is over. And then I went on to write, as we just begin to see through the fog of the COVID-19, we realize this too will have an end. Not knowing when is daunting, not yet understanding the full consequences is scary, but there is solace in realizing the raging 2020 COVID-19, not its memories, will come to a close. Bob, thank you for having me. I love you and I love the entire HAR membership. And if there's anything I could ever do for you, and I'm really sad that 10 people left during my poem because the <laughs> end was really horrible. 
helpful. <laughs> anyway, thank you, thank you. Brad, you're a, you're a great friend. We appreciate it. You are Mr. Real Estate and have a safe time and tell Yaz hello. Hey, and do me a favor. Yeah. Let's yeah. give five more freebies. You just figure out a reason. Um, right. you know, the hardest working realtors, no big shots. Right. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's commenting now that they love you, Brad. So <laughs> uh, really quick before we, uh, before we sign off, uh, Brad, we do have people wondering about the conference. What are the hot topics? Anything we can look forward to? New technology you're excited about? Anything like that? All of the above, but most importantly, how to get you through the dog days of the summer of 2020. And I hate to say it, but they're going to be tough, but we're there for you. And you're going to leave with essentials, takeaways, and how to survive a really tough period coming up. And we're there for you. So, so count on us to put something on that will be fun and interesting. Lots of stories because Brad loves to tell them and, but great speakers, great panelists. And uh, if it's not worth your while, you know the Brad, uh, can, you know, promise the Brad guarantee. I'll refund your money, and I'll refund your airfare and your hotel. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Love you, buddy. Do you want to pick some people, Brad? What's that? You want to pick some people for uh, tickets? I'll let you do it. Okay. But remember, no big shots. No big shots. Okay, got it. Um, well, thank you everyone for your time today. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Bob. Always great hearing you too. Um, remember that uh, you can sign up for more. We have Christy Kelly with uh, Realtor.com who's going to be on tomorrow. Uh, we did a run through with her today and she's got some really exciting video content to share with you all. So sign up for that and everything we have next week. A lot of you were asking about um, an economic forecast. We have Ted Jones next week. So har.com slash webinars. And don't forget to get your Inman Connect ticket. As Brad said, uh, I shared the link. It's just har.com slash Inman Select is how you sign up for your select subscription if you haven't yet. And that will get you your discounted ticket. So thank you all for your time today. I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.